Hello everyone, this is a video on the Hyperoptic provided Tilgin router, which is the model number HG2381 underscore UK. This is about the web interface and show you hopefully as many of the pages as I can in the web interface. So if you're trying to support somebody with one of these routers, you can go through this video and uh, find out what page you need to be on and what it looks like so you can talk somebody through it. I might go a bit quick, so make sure you remember that YouTube has a pause button, or even uh, if you're on the desktop version, you can slow it down if you need. There's probably also in the description a um, timecode list of where you need to uh, be in the video for some of the different functions. I also have several other videos which will be in the description about how to factory reset it and also what the sockets. Uh, look like on the router as well. So the default IP address of the router is 192.168.1.1 and the password is on the label on the underside. It's called Web UI Password. It's top right hand corner of the label and it is a horribly complex password. Uh, so in my case it's uppercase X, lowercase O, uppercase W, uppercase S, lowercase C, lowercase u, lowercase k, etc. Um, there's no way that somebody's going to remember that. Uh, and also if they're typing on, say, for example, a mobile phone or uh, an iPad, the chance to make a mistake while typing that password is very high. So this is the default screen. It doesn't let you change stuff, but it does show you uh, the wireless status and um, online status. And then you click on one of the wirelesses and it just uh, tells you that you're you're not logged in. So you, know, you can get to all of the help documentation. Uh, so let's log on. Now we've logged on, nothing's changed on this front page, but we do have all these options that have appeared along the top. Uh, the one that I'm testing with isn't connected to a broadband service or anything else. It's, uh, there's nothing really connected to it other than my test laptop, so it won't be the same as if you're using a live setup. There'll be uh, probably some other stuff that you can see. So if we click on setup, and let's just click through these. A lot of these, I, even I don't know what to expect on this router. It says L2TP IPsec server. That's very interesting. It looks almost like you can run an IPsec inbound uh, VPN to your network with all sorts of enterprise uh, stuff like radius authentication. Uh, the mention of NAT here reminds me that a lot of uh, hyperoptic customers will be on carrier grade NAT, so some of the port forwarding functions won't work. Uh, neither will UPnP or, for example, these settings to let it listen for a VPN server. Uh, you'd need to be paying Hyperoptic the extra per month to have a public static IP address. So let's do the IPsec. Hmm. Not sure what that is. It's interesting that it says LTTP server, but it's WAN setup. Like this should actually be a client, but. Uh, very unusual. Um, however, it's very unlikely that anyone will ever use that function, so I would gloss over that. We've got the LAN setup options. You can have LAN groups, so it looks like you, this uh, router supports VLAN tagging. Again, quite unusual for a home router. So I presume this is one of the or the ports on the back of the router, the four LAN ports, and then the two Wi-Fi ports or Wi-Fi uh, radios. Firewall and NAT services. I'm not sure what this would do on Hyperoptic. If you un undid the uh, enable NAT service, it might turn the router into bridge mode. But there's very little point because you may as well just plug your own router directly into the ONT, uh, which is in the one that I saw was a Genexis square box on the wall that turns the fibre into Ethernet. I'm going to skip advanced for the moment and let's go on to wireless. And frustratingly on um, these 
if I, I don't know whether it will show me the password, but in the settings for each of the wireless, they have a different password. So the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi has this password ending in capital S, capital S, and the 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi has a different password end, ending in uh, 5 capital U. It's very unusual for uh, just a standard home ISP router to have different passwords for the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz. Um, but there we go, that's I guess what they've chosen to do by default. So general physical setup, you can enable it, whatever coexistence mode is, change the power level, so for example if you knew you only needed it to cover one room, you may as well set it to 12%, 6% or whatever works for you, it'll save you a little bit of electricity, and you can change the channel width for your 2.4 gigahertz radio and also change the channel by default it seems to be on auto channel and only seems to let you select 1, 6 or 11 which are the sensible channels to select in the UK so it's not too bad. Let's go over to the 5 gigahertz over here enabled power level nice to see that they've got it defaulted to 80 megahertz channel width which will give you the quickest speed that you can get out of that 5 gigahertz radio and once again it's automatically on auto um, but you can select from a list of many more channels on the 5 gigahertz. Let's go back to AP list. Okay so you can use the router itself to do a wireless survey. It might be useful if you wanted to know which of your wireless channels are likely to work very well. And let's go to changing the wireless settings. So I'm going to go into the 5 gigahertz one, so you can set it, you can change its wireless name, which is what you'd see if you brought up the list of available networks on your phone or your computer. Uh, you can set it as hidden. User isolations, probably what would otherwise be called guest mode, where uh, somebody that joins it can't connect to other devices on that same wireless point. Possibly also other devices on the LAN, but you'd need to test that. Uh, we've got some advanced stuff, which probably shouldn't play with there. In the security, that's where you'd set the password if you wanted to make that easier. Make sure you use the passphrase section because that's where you just type a simple passphrase. If you use the data bit, you would need to type um, a hex string of uh, numbers and letters that are the hex. Or set no wireless password, which would be, well, depending on your usage, if you're in a cafe or something, might make sense. But uh, for general home use, you probably do want a password. You've got the WPS option, which allows you to turn the button on the side off and on uh, to allow people to connect without needing the uh, to type the big password in. Um, remember, if you are turning off that WPS button, you'll probably need to do that under the 2.4 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz setting. Associated clients. None are associated because I'm plugged in via a network cable, but if you had people using your network, that's where you'd see them in that list. Access lists. Mm. So a lot of people like using this, but it's not very secure at all. Uh, it's very easy to spoof a MAC address, so uh, try not to use the MAC address lists as security. Have a good password on your network instead, and if you're worried, uh, regularly change that password. Multimedia is to do with uh, QoS, which I wouldn't even know what to advise to change in there, so probably leave well alone. And let's go to Tools. We can reboot the router, which will be the same as unplugging it and plugging it back into the mains. And we can do the factory restore or reset, which uh, would be the same as sticking a paper clip or a pin into the back of the router for about 10 seconds. The status screen we've seen some of earlier. Under the network connectivity, it gives you a lot of information about packets received and sent and errors on each port. Connections will be, I guess, the WAN connection. So this one is saying uh, that it's not available because it's not plugged into um, a hyperoptic line. 
and same for IPv6 here as well. Management connection probably relates to TR69, which allows Hyperoptic to uh, view and change settings on the router, uh, otherwise known as ACS or auto, auto configuration services. Uh, LAN clients shows you the devices that have connected. Uh, rather, in the wireless section, it will only show you the ones which are on those particular Wi Fi things, but the LAN clients will show you probably everything. So, whether it's plugged in through the Ethernet or on the wireless, uh, you'll see it in this list. And the same for MAC addresses. So, if you plug in a switch, for example, into uh, one of the Ethernet ports, you'll see a load of MAC addresses on that Ethernet port. Multicast seems to be disabled, and I haven't got a USB device plugged in for storage. Account is to do with VoIP. Let's see whether we can uh, set that up with something that isn't a hyperoptic VoIP service. And it looks like you can. So you can set a registration server. So if you weren't using hyperoptic's own VoIP service, you could probably set that to uh, something else. So um, Andrews and Arnold or uh, yay.com, uh, SIPgate, whatever. Uh, and as long as Hyperoptic haven't locked that down um, because, as I say, this is on, not on a hyperoptic line. It's possible if you connected it to a hyperoptic line, they would uh, deploy settings to the router to lock that down. But if you had a VoIP service with another provider, certainly in its factory reset mode, um, it looks like you'd be able to configure it. Phone presumably will be status. Interesting decked base station, but I would be surprised if it has that built into it. So it looks like it's probably an extra um, box that you plug into the router. That's for wireless or cordless telephones. You can add a block list of numbers and change the volume of calls. Storage will be to do with if you had plugged in a um, memory stick or a hard disk into the side of the router or the back of the router, and it will act as a network server. The same it looks like you can do with printers. If you plugged in a USB printer, uh, presumably this one will have to be one that's compatible with it because there's a lot of different USB printing protocols. Um, it will act as a network print server as well. Now click on this activate VoIP settings button and see what happens. Looks like uh, it applies the VoIP settings. If you've been changing stuff in the uh, account section, doing the activate VoIP settings must uh, must actually tell that to, to go ahead and make those changes. So going into the advanced, which I skipped earlier, we've got UPnP. Uh, which is universal plug and play to do with automatically port boarding stuff. So if you have uh, game consoles or if you're using torrent software, uh, Skype and probably some other stuff, um, UPnP allows those devices or bits of software to tell your router to automatically port forward stuff through to your computer or to your console. Um, as I say, Hyperoptic uses uh, carrier grade NAT, or CG NAT for most people, so uh, any port forwards that are made on your router won't get um, through anyway because it will get stopped at the carrier grade NAT uh, device so most of this stuff won't be useful unless you do have a public static IP address from Hyperoptic. Uh, DMZ which is demilitarized zone for port forwarding everything rather than individual ports And under the port forwarding screen, wow, <laughs> what, what a difficult way of forwarding ports. So LAN client, that machine, or you can do an IP address, okay, that's not too bad. And then it looks like you need to have added a template for whatever it is you want to port forward. So for example, let's try and do a port forward on port uh, 5500. 
So apps, I'm going to add a template into apps. Let's call that VNC listening. And then do I click on apply? Okay, yep, that did add it. So now if I click on VNC listening, I can add in TCP 5500, uh, 5500, destination 5500. Can also do port translation there, which is uh, quite useful. So now if I go to port forwarding through to my laptop, and hopefully, yeah, there we go, VNC listening uh, on uh, whether I want it to be IPv6 or DHCP. I'm not sure why you'd ever select the IPv6, because with IPv6, everything in your network is supposed to have a public IPv6 address. Uh, but if you wanted it on your IPv4 static address, you'd click on that and click on Add. And there we, there we go, we have it as an active rule. Not sure what the new rule is about. Hmm, looks like yet another different method of adding a port forward as well, without having to first add a template. Into IP filters, I guess uh, you can do essentially the reverse of uh, the port forwarding, maybe where it blocks stuff to devices. So, particularly clear, add block with template active filters. Hmm. So, I guess you could port forward stuff and then block some IPs from getting to it. Not entirely clear on that. So LAN clients will show you uh, a bit like the status page would, um, except it also allows you to set it as a reserved IP address so that the client will always get the same IP address. And dynamic DNS, which again on hyperoptic is a bit pointless because if you um, if you're not on a static IP address, then you can't connect into your router, so there's not much point having a dynamic DNS IP address. Um, and then if you have a static IP address, you don't need a dynamic DNS service because you have a static IP address. So there we go, that seems to be all of the settings within the Hyperoptic Tilgin HG2361 router. Um, hopefully this video has been helpful to you. If it has, it would be really helpful to me if you wouldn't mind subscribing to my YouTube channel. You don't need to have the notifications switched on for new videos, but the subscriber numbers are really helpful. Thank you very much.